Hola, hola, muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Alexia y que soy con mi compañera Jen y seremos sus intérpretes el día de hoy. Hello, hello. My name is Alexia and I'm here with my companion Jen and we will be your interpreters today. Eh, estamos aquí para interpretar entre el español y el inglés trabajando con un marco que se llama justicia del lenguaje. We are here to interpret between Spanish and English, working within a framework called language justice. Eh, la justicia del lenguaje es el derecho que todas las personas tenemos de comunicarnos, entender y ser entendidas en nuestros idiomas y en los que nos sintamos más cómodos. Language justice is based on the idea that we all have the right to speak, to communicate in our languages um, and to use the languages in which we feel most comfortable. También incluye el, eh, dere el respeto a los derechos lingüísticos de todas las personas. It also includes the language rights of all people. Entonces queremos empezar reconociendo todos los idiomas presentes aquí. So we want to start by recognizing all of the languages present here. Y en particular los idiomas de los pueblos indígenas de las diferentes tierras en las que nos encontramos. Eh, por ejemplo, eh, Jen, Eleana y yo estamos en Los Ángeles, lo cual es territorio Tongva eh, no cedido. And in particular, we want to honor the languages and the lands of the indigenous peoples whose lands we are on um, from wherever we're calling in from today. For example, Jen, Eleana and I are on unceded Tongva land. Entonces, para facilitar la conversación hoy, vamos a estar usando la función de interpretación de Zoom que ya eh, ha sido activada. So, in order to facilitate communication in today's conversation, we'll be using the Zoom interpreting function, which has already been activated. Entonces, eh, si usted se está conectando a través de una computadora, eh, va a haber un icono en forma de mundo que está en la parte inferior de la pantalla, en su, en su menú de Zoom, y ahí puede seleccionar su idioma. Eh, ya sea el español o el inglés. So if you're connecting via a computer, you should see a little globe icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you click there, you'll be able to see a menu, which allows you to choose your language, either Spanish or English. Si usted se está conectando por su tableta o teléfono, pulse donde dice más y después verá un menú que incluye la opción de interpretación de idiomas y luego selecciona su canal de idioma preferido. If you're using a phone or a tablet, you need to click more and then you'll see an option of language interpretation. You click on that and then you'll be able to choose your language. Eh, si usted no puede ver el mundo o la opción de interpretación de idiomas en este momento, le recomendamos actualizar su Zoom y para cualquier duda, por favor, pónganse en contacto con Juan por medio del chat. If for any reason you can't see the globe or the interpreting option, the first thing to do is to update your Zoom app. And the second thing to do is to contact Juan on the chat. And um, please don't hesitate to do that. Okay, entonces eso es todo. Eh, muchísimas gracias a Lace por hacer posible que estemos aquí. Nos da muchísimo gusto poder apoyar este espacio multilingüe, así como el proyecto de Intergalactics, ya que sentimos una fuerte solidaridad con el trabajo que todas las personas aquí presentes hacen. So that's everything for the moment. Thank you so much to Lace for making it possible for us to be here. We're really happy to be here because we feel very deep solidarity with the work that you are doing and particularly with Intergalactics. Thank you very much. Hola, bienvenidos a todos. Eh, me, soy Daniela Lieja Quintanar. Soy... Hi, welcome to everyone. I'm Daniela Lieja. I am one of the curators at LACE, um, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. And today we're very happy to be connected with Adán Vallecillo and Armando Perla. Uh, it's an honor to have them here to have you all here and first I want to say that we are here in Los Angeles we are on Tongva land as my um, interpreting uh, compañeros said and we honor the effort and the the long and significant work of resistance that the Tongva people have been doing for many years um, 
and will continue to do, has been doing, is doing now, and will continue to do. The first thing I want to do is speak a little bit about intergalactics, and then I will present uh, Triangle Another, the um, ADANS project. Intergalactics uh, Contra el Aislamiento Against Isolation is um, a collective exhibition, but it's also a, a long term research project into the diaspora, which concentrates on collectivity in our cosmic condition to resist historical violence through physical and conceptual experimentation. It also works against the severe and brutal uh, immigration policies the United States has promoted for many years. The border has become the greatest political machine for the annihilation of human beings. It's a global system led by the United States, the borders and migratory systems. Anti-colonial struggles for life have manifested historically as a response to these oppressive systems. In this sense, Intergalactics presents a platform for uh, encounter where exchange can happen among artists, poets, researchers, activists, curators, uh, and, and writers from a wide range of different fields and practices, all of us working against isolation. This isolation uh, in which right at this very moment, just a few miles away in Los Angeles, uh, there are migrant Central American migrant children still being caged in concentration camps. This isolation also of our memories, the isolation, the system that has separated us from our histories and that has fragmented us and driven us apart. The concept of intergalactics is inspired by the intergalactic uh, encounter, the encounter intergalactico that the Zapatista movement in this we started in 1996 that they began. They have a forum for the defense of humanity and again, all to any form of life inside and or outside our galaxy. And we continue within uh, resonance with, with that call, thinking about the earth, the waters on our planet, and not just thinking about human beings. The gaze of this project is diasporic and takes energy uh, from the entire continent. We uh, are listening in from the center, from Central America, but also we understand Central America together with the south of Mexico as one region of indigenous inheritance in constant struggle for sovereignty, the north and south of the continent. We think about this research project to using that center as our point of departure. Today, we're gathering, we're meeting with Adan, who is a very, very important guest for, for us. He's been very central to our research um, and the Intergalactics team. Um, in El Salvador, we had an incredible opportunity to meet each other. And from, from there, we started a working relationship, but also a, a relationship of, of care and uh, affection. And that's part of Intergalactics also, which is to create network solidarity networks and, um, and relationships based on trust and based on care. Um, Intergalactics, which is where uh, how we've been inviting different collaborators to work with us, we're thinking about mapping to create genealogic maps around collaborative practices and also how our free imaginations around roots will allow us to, to develop a trajectory of memory toward the possible. It's a constant search for what has been erased and repressed by colonial systems toward the inter intergalactics. Maps are the, the maps we create are results of our gathering and our dialogues. And in this case, when we met up with Adan, uh, he proposed Triangulo Noter, uh, another triangle. And he's going to talk to us in a moment about this concept. I'm gonna, I would like to um, introduce them now quickly so that you can um, talk amongst yourselves. But I just want to remind ourselves that this moment that's occurring right now, it's very important 
to have Adan's voice as an artist, as um, uh, a curator from Honduras, and that he's connecting from there, from Honduras to Los Angeles. Adan Vallecillo is a visual artist and independent curator. He studied sociology and art in Tegucigalpa. And can you hear me? Yes, right? And in San Juan, Puerto Rico. His work seeks to generate platforms of production and exchange that are open, self-sufficient, and responsible with the communities and ecosystems where they are developed that have as a priority to encourage collaboration, conceptualization, and placement of proposals that involve cultural producers of the Central American region and that work for the consolidation of networks of friendship and critical solidarity. As you can see there, there's so much resonance with the Intergalactics project. Adan has produced many, many exhibitions and projects um, one of them is um, a public art project called Mesotropicos in the in Panama City uh, this year. He also participated in performance festivals Reino La Tigra and Reino Amapola, both in Honduras between 2018 and 2020. Uh, now I'm going to introduce Armando, uh, our other guest. Um, Armando Perla is an assistant professor, professor, a consultant, activist, and independent curator who works with museums, cultural institutions, and communities on issues of human rights and social inclusion in Canada and around the globe. He's a member of the board of directors, both at the Canadian Museums Association and at the International Council of Museums, uh, the International Committee of Ethical Dilemmas. Berla was part of the founding team of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and the Swedish Museum of Migration and Democracy. He's also served as an international advisor on museums, human rights, and social inclusion for the city of Medellin, Colombia. Armando has a, huge, a really significant bio we also have that up on our website if um, anybody would like to know more about him. Um, but I just wanted to uh, thank you all for being here um, and being part of such an important conversation and for connecting. Welcome uh, from, from here in Lace uh, to El Salvador and Canada, welcome. Hi, Daniela, thank you so much for creating this opportunity. The last time that I was uh, there in El Salvador, we were trapped there at the beginning of the pandemic. And today I'm, I'm returning to coordinate a series of talks that are gonna be developing and beginning uh, starting today through the 31st of, of June. Um, until the 31st, we have another in September. We're still waiting to confirm that. But the idea of doing this in El Salvador was um, had a very clear intention that Triangulo Noter should function as a kind of satellite of intergalactics. And the truth is that it was a, a fairly complex uh, exercise to invite all of the different people that we wanted to have present and to listen to their experiences and their trajectory around migratory issues and, and art. In the case of Armando, for instance, we've had the great good luck that he would accept this invitation because Armando is not just a person with a tremendous experience in the field of human rights, but also um, he, in his, own, in his own right, is a migrant. And so it seemed very important to us um, to have this complementary um, presence. And so thanks to another curator, we were able to connect with Armando. Uh, we never had had the opportunity to, to have a conversation in this way as we are now. So I wanted to welcome you, Armando. I wanted to thank um, the Spanish Cultural Center in El Salvador, which has opened their doors to us to be able to work from here. Uh, we might say that the uh, 
satellite, uh, the intergalactic satellite is here in the Spanish Cultural Center in El Salvador. Uh, they've given us a warm welcome, Antonio Romero, who's part of the, the team who's been working with us and is gonna be one of the people with whom we're working, we're gonna be uh, chatting later, Gustavo, who's supporting us with uh, the technical aspects. And we also wanted to um, thank the rest of the artists and creators, curators, who have accepted the invitation to be part of these dialogues. And as I said, uh, as, as we were saying earlier, we have the great good fortune to begin with Armando. Something that I didn't mention, Triangulo Noter, uh, in addition to being a satellite of Intergalactis, is also a digitalization of, uh, or is, is a, a version of the idea Triangulo Norte, Northern Triangle, uh, which has to do with organized crime, gangs, how they're thinking about those in relationship to uh, migration, and it's used in a pejorative way. Uh, so we might think about how that word um, to think about the north of the others, another triangle. Um, Armando, so Armando, welcome. Uh, with no further um, preamble, I'd like to begin this conversation. We're going to talk a little bit to start. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a synthesis of what our dialogue is going to be, and then we'll um, have a more relaxed and extensive conversation. Welcome, Armando. Thank you, Adan, for this invitation. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Lace, and the Spanish Cultural Center in El Salvador. And just before beginning, I want to also um, acknowledge that I am connecting today from uh, unceded traditional um, Tangahada territories, territories, and that I am a uh, racialized colonizer who lives benefiting from the fact that I'm able to use indigenous lands. Well, Armando, thank you. Well, I would like to that we to begin a little bit speaking, um, Armando, uh, about you as a whole and integrated person. Who are you? And how have has uh, your experience of migration marked uh, your own professional uh, formation and development. Thank you, Adan, for that question. That's a, not a small question. Um, it really makes me think about a lot about who I am. And I want to make a pause because I'm a person who, like many of us, I'm very complex. I have many intersecting identities. Um, that is chapter after chapter of my lived experience. And really, I don't know exactly how I would define myself, maybe not in one specific way, but I'm Salvadoran, I'm Canadian, I'm queer. I was a refugee. I um, am an asylum seeker or was an asylum seeker. I live with disabil invisible disabilities and chronic illness, thousands of things, right? So the question that you asked me is, um, what, how has my migration experience impacted me and impacted my professional um, trajectory? And I think in many, many ways, uh, it's really shaped who I am as a person, not just professionally, but also on a personal level. But in terms of professional um, impact, since I arrived um, as an asylum seeker in Canada, my first job was precisely helping to create um, or, or um, uplift the, his, the stories of people who are asylum seekers. So they would be taken into account um, uh, by the Immigration Council and the Immigration Board of Canada. So in the same, uh, along that same road, as we've said, I was working with, with migrants um, through the Central American Center for Human Rights um, in Washington, with children who've been victims of human trafficking in Central America, also from Guatemala, with migrant workers as well uh, in Re the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And in the, all those experiences, all that work to really understand the migrant experience um, that comes from my own experience that gives us that kind of um, critical um, understanding of subalt subalterity. In many ways as migrants, we end up in subaltern spaces or subalt as Spivak might tell us about Sonia Hardington, um, uh, what you might call the uh, 
uh, colonial life or como Glissant talks about um, uh, colonial life as well. So this capacity, this, this subaltern vision that we have as migrants, um, this kind of knowledge um, that is generated by dominant classes doesn't always, um, isn't always understood. So this has been what I've used really to be able to anchor my professional practice, which um, first I became, was a practitioner of human rights, but then I became um, a museum professional. And all of this thinking through art and lived experience and professional experience also working in the system of human rights, working with migrants, brings I bring all of this to the curatorial work I do in the world of museums. And I think also um, it gave me an advantage really um, the critical angle so that I could do my work in, in a way that would be anchored in that practice. So my work has been to into large to a large extent, not exclusively, but to a large extent extent has been in, has been focused. Well, I've been focused on working with voices that have historically been excluded and giving them priority. And in my curatorial processes or museum museum processes, I've been giving those voices priority and those lives priority. But as I was saying, this work has also focused on working with other groups of migrants and working with them to do co-creation. So for example, I don't believe in this, the role of a superstar curator who's going to take a decision of what's going to make a decision of what's going to go in the exhibition. I've always worked from a position of co-creation, of working with community from a position of solidarity. So I think that all of that also comes from my lived experience, as I was saying, and as you were asking, right, I think that if I hadn't experienced all of those, this, those uh, migration experiences and worked with so many people who've had different migration experiences, I don't think I'd be able to be working in the way that I work because I wouldn't be able either to understand what it is to cross a border, for instance, on foot to bring my sister. I also brought my sister to cross the border. I wouldn't understand what it is to be put into a box and say, okay, we're just victims. We come from such and such region. So all of this kind of knowledge and all of these tools is what would have allowed me to see from a different perspective, maybe that's not the perspective maybe it's not the most common perspective in in museum work um and more than more than anything in national level or large national level museums so it's maybe it's important to, to work from that perspective yes well and uh, now that you've mentioned the experience of uh, work as a human rights activist with children and immigrants as well Recently, um, there was a, a media explosion in Canada that will, will it just became international that said that starting in 1863 till 68, uh, more than 50,000 indigenous children were separated for, from their families and taken to uh, state uh, institutions in Canada, which has uh, unchanged several reactions and reactions in several areas and Canadian society and the world. Some institutions, some uh, human rights institutions question the role of the Canadian government for supporting this, uh, this these politics of uh, cultural genocide. They uh, did not uh, raise uh, with the original countries at the same time that were taking over their uh, resources and their land. In the case of the most recent migrations that come from the called Triangulo Norte, the Northern Triangle, that will include uh, hundreds of children, which who a lot of them are unaccompanied. Countries like Canada or uh, the US and even countries in uh, the European Union they, um, in a way, in the past, let's say that it was uh, the, the impact of this migration was not as strong, but like today, it is really pointing more to, uh, to more repressive uh, policies, policies of control of these uh, forced migrations. And it seems that it is repeating the same pattern is repeating over and over again. And it is oppressive in which these uh, countries are. Um, getting rid of their human responsibilities or responsibilities to people well thank you for that and i think there are several several layers to that a uh, uh, question and i think i think i'm going to start with uh, uh canada and 
with uh, the indigenous uh, schools that it is a genocide that's been committed in Canada. So like I said, this year, there's a lot of uh, media interest in this story, right? In which a lot of uh, the, the places where the, the, the bodies of the children had been placed. So this is something that this is and nothing new, unfortunately. And um, it is something that it is starting to become well known internationally. It is something that And we had a, a Comisión de la Verdad, a truth commissioner, commission of truth that collected testimonies from everybody who were survive, uh, survivors. And this keeps happening. But uh, what happened is like right now, the system has uh, changed. And it has uh, changed only in uh, names and it is the system for children's benefits that they, they're still taking the children from their indigenous parents and this hasn't changed it's still the same and it is very interesting that you are mentioning this because when i started to work in the canadian museum of human rights precisely i shared an office with the indigenous curator the first indigenous curator of the museum trisha logan and she is a mestiza even the mestiza identity is different than the one we understand uh, in latin america here in canada so trisha it is specialized precisely in, in this and trisha quit the museum because the museum did not want to admit that a genocide took place in canada so she couldn't go back to the communities with whom she was working and just face them working in a place that was not accepting of that. And this has been, I think Trisha quit in 2013, so some years ago. So this is something that comes from a while back. It is nothing new, maybe for the international media, it might be recent, but it is something that it is a reflection of the way in which our Canadian government presents itself, right? Because the, to the public, it is presented as a government that defends human rights, that it is a progressive government, that it is a feminist government as it is, but within the power structures, right? We can very clearly see that um, uh, the story, history is completely, it's very much different. And I think this uh, talks to the second part of the question that are the about the unaccompanied children it is something that's very interesting because canada is always presented as this paradise for immigrants right so canada is seen as a place where yes i mean people who are not accepted in the u.s yes, can come here and they will be accepted here and this we saw for example in 2017 18 and we also uh, saw that right after trump's election in the u.s that uh, we started to see a significant increase of, uh, of asylum seekers getting to the borders coming from the US, a lot of them being uh, from Central America. And they uh, came here because during uh, Trump's administration, Justin Trudeau, our president, uh, tweeted saying that the refugees would be welcome here in Canada. So there was this commotion, and again, the image that Canada uh, portrays on the world, I mean, it creates this influx, right, of uh, asylum seekers getting to the border, but the government is not providing with the resources to all of the settlement agencies that are the ones who are in charge of dealing with all the uh, people coming here. So in that moment, I was precisely, I was making an, I was part of an exhibition, a film about the work of these settlement agencies and they were so angry with the prime minister because yes, people are coming and you know we don't have resources and the government is not giving us extra resources so we are able to respond to the needs of these people that are uh, arriving here a lot of them children like you were saying so this image that canada is projecting onto the world but i mean uh, 
my mom would say that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, no action. And I'm trying to be very respectful for the time that we have. And then maybe we can continue the conversation later. Yes. And I mean, not even mentioning the role of Canada, you know, the extractivism that takes place in Canada through their mining industries and companies. A lot of those children and immigrants and adults are displaced from those communities because of the impact, the environmental impact that is generated because of those companies that a lot of them come from Canadian capital. So there's a lot of myths around Canada that we should start to question. Well, Armando, thank you. So I just wanted for you to talk uh, about your experience as an activist and advocate for human rights, but also we should, um, this is this goes together uh, to your practice as a curator. So we would like to know your uh, opinion because if we see the curatorial practice as a power exercise over bodies, and how is those uh, power relationships manifested when they are referencing uh, immigrants, there is a common denominator that has been identified in, in those uh, exposing in all the countries that receive uh, the immigrants. In your case, you have lived in several countries such as the US and Canada or uh, Sweden. What could you say about uh, that? Yes, well, I think that is a very important question and very interesting because Precisely, there's a, there is an image and not only, not, not every museum, but there's a museums that do different work, particularly smaller museums. But if we uh, look at the larger museums, if you want to call that, what is it like the national museums or the ones who have the most resources, we are able to see that there are uh, common patterns in the way that uh, immigrant stories are represented. And I think that the root of this is the lack of uh, people who has uh, this lived experience as immigrants in the positions where uh, decisions can be taken in a museum. So for example, if we're talking about uh, the uh, case of the U.S. Yeah, the Andrew Mellon Canada in particular in 2014, the Andrew Mellon Foundation did a study about uh, diversity in um, the uh, leadership positions in the U U.S. museums, and I think some Mexican museums and some Canadian museums. So 84 percent of the leadership positions were uh, occupied by white people in 2018. They followed up, and the numbers did not change much. So in uh, these uh, studies. As a result, it was that the widest position is the, the position of, of a curator. So it was like, well, who are making these decisions, right? So if we do not have these uh, people that have a lived experience, like we said from the beginning, like to really know what it means, you know, that they, they see you only as a victim or or that maybe they don't really know or are not aware about the multiple layers about the uh, immigrant experience. But let's say like my own experience, I have been seeking asylum, I've been a refugee, I've been, I've been also a, a, a professional, highly qualified professional, I've been everything. But once uh, people read that I was a refugee, and that is the first thing where they like focus on and they want to present that so like the tale that a lot of museums are presenting is this tale about the victimization uh the refugees or immigrants as uh, victims as people who uh, escape the regions of uh, violence and uh, this i think this is truly a way of reinforcing this privilege in this very comfortable position that uh, the audience or the the public and these museums that are majority white sobre la fotografía. En cómo, about uh, photography and susan sontag speaks about this and how representation of these uh, immigrant uh, bodies with and no kind of uh, contextualizing only the representation of suffering what i call like the pornography of uh, suffering 
uh, this uh, really what it does is simply creating reactions oh well good thing that it's not us right i mean our country is so good because it uh, receives these people and you know it goes they were doing charity and like the previous question was about the humanitarian and for me going beyond the humanitarian we have to go back to thinking about the legal obligations and the legal yeah the legal obligations that are um the states have where in canada is part of uh, the refugee convention and uh, there are some requirements that uh, people should be received people who go who get to those borders same as the us who have a, a justified or credible fear of being uh, tortured or killed or you know it is it is not charity uh the reason behind we're uh receiving the refugees it is a legal obligation so i think like this discourse we are not um analyzing these are discourses that are presented as very simplistic and i think to really uh maintain the comfort of these white audiences that get here they see the exhibition they are touched they feel better because it's not them and then they feel better because they are engaging in charity work but they're not truly moved towards an action that might change the situation in which we live and i think this is one of the largest problems that we have in a way um that how museums work yes well and that a last thing that uh, you mentioned has to do with the magnificent reactions that have been happening in the present where there is uh, an increasing speed to reproduce those criticisms as a response like for example right now we are questioning the double uh, morality of a lot of these cultural institutions of the first world such as the ones you were mentioning and uh, specifically uh, several uh, uh, contemporary art museums and art museums uh, policies just to mention some policies and practices such as support of washing or pink washing or black lives matter washing is there a similar concept that implies or that encompasses immigrants could you talk about how you could see those practices in the art world and how not fall into them i think that everything you've mentioned also applies to the experience of migrating because i really see the experience of migrating as an intersectional experience as well so i feel like when we're talking about um pink washing we could also and that there's also intersectionality there with what is homo nationalism so we might and that I, 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 is something that I was just thinking about mentioning. So for instance, national museums, I've worked more um, often with national museums. So let's say that. So national museums, what they do is that they create the official version of the country, the, the official story, the official history of um, a, a country. So in the case of Canada, a lot of what I've been fighting for inside the, the uh, Museum of Human Rights, which is a national museum, was really to try to go against those narratives of progress, those narratives of of the country of Canada as a progressive country, as I was saying before, or as a as a country that gives a welcome to refugees, particularly if we're talking about um, LGBTI um, refugees. So we're we're oh we're such good people because we receive them because in their um countries they're um they're persecuted we protect them from the homophobia of all these people who are these 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 people who are oppressed because they're racialized etc cetera, etc cetera. so when we think about intersectionality with homo nationalism at the same time um what I feel is that what you could you could talk about this in the following way so what I was talking about before for instance with um the the comments of uh, uh, the homophobic comments of our governor who uh, so museums then replicate this same type of patronage pro uh, problematics or the patterns that are created in the government are repeated by museums by artists by it by aesthetic processes so i was working on an exhibition for example with the rohingya community who are at this moment experiencing genocide in burma and the museum decided unilaterally without consulting the community um, to use a white photographer who was not part of the community who um, had um, 
was you, taking photographs from an, um, a, an airplane of people who were fleeing into refugee camps in Bangladesh. So these photos are super humanized with the drama, the melodrama of their situation. And there's a critic, a critique of those filters. Almost they they make um, their, the brown skinned look more ashy and all of these types of things. And we talked a lot about this with the problematics of these images when we're looking at images of refugees. So what I feel is that this has to do specifically with what we were just talking about. So in these um, museums, when they continue to perpetuate this kind of narrative in our countries as countries of, pr of progress, of countries that are an ideal, that we want to reach that ideal, without really using the critical gaze around how forced mi migration or refugees or any kind of migrant might experience things when we get to these countries. So for instance, we never see, I shouldn't say never because I know I know not to generalize in that way. We also have to think about, about self-critique in that way. And there are, are opportunities in music, but it's very rare to see exhibitions, for instance, where we can see the lack of support for the trans community who comes to these countries and who many many of them end up committing suicide because there isn't there aren't social networks there aren't networks of support on the part of the government which is the has the responsibility to protect people's human rights institutions and organizations um, and groups of, of of volunteers citizens they're private groups that are supporting people they don't need to be responsible for providing these services the government should do that. So if we don't think critically, for instance, in, in our exhibitions, um, we're also not going to see, for instance, from other positions when, uh, for example, when there was a huge surge after the election of Trump of, of larger numbers of people coming to the borders, we could see also the, the need to undo the myths of who is a, a refugee, who is an asylum seeker, what are the different types of of rights that people have when they get here. These, this was a response and the community, the media was constantly repeating the story that migrants who arrived to the border were breaking the law. They were breaking the law to cross the border, which is not true. It's, it's right. The term the term is illegal immigrant. Right, that that term illegal that's used. So we don't see this in mainstream museums. We don't see them taking a, a more, we see like a more refined or sophisticated version of this. We don't see a critical view, but they 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 generate a sense of pity, but they don't really generate a critique of the systems that we live in and a critique of the ways that those systems have contributed to making that type of situation worse. Yes, thank you. Armando, I think it's been, you've done, you've brought us a really a deep and extensive reflection on these points around uh, of conversation. And I would like to, um, this conversation is not gonna end here. I'd like to open the space so that the audience can also um, ask some questions or, or share their comments. So maybe we can open the chat, please, um, to receive comments. Daniela, I don't know if you wanted to comment anything. Hi, yes, thank you so much for these reflections. I was just thinking a lot about the issue or the question of museums, the impossibility of being able to bring this kind of discourse into a museum, because as you were explaining so clearly, Armando, in and of itself, it's an institution. It's a colonial institution that exists, that has a s extreme power, that it dominates discourse. And dis the discourse is how they say it's going to be. So speaking, Armando, of subalterity or alternative spaces, even though that term is also a little bit um, uh, in conflict, but thinking about intergalactics, which is taking place from LACE, which is a space, it's a nonprofit. It has a long um, social legacy. And even so it's difficult because we're in a system, a granting system. We rely on grants. We have to respond to certain discourses. So 
when Trump was in power, everyone was talking about migration. Trump left and it was like, so maybe that's why Intergalactics had a lot of um, economic support because when we began to apply for grants, we had that situation, but now no one is talking about the kids, the children who are in cages or about migration. And I just wanted to ask you, since I've never worked this way, that way um, directly with museums, how, or I wanted to ask you both, how do you, how do we imagine ourselves or how can we envision a shift or a, a change in the discourse? And I don't know, how can we occupy the space, occupy the spaces that of, in those museums, there's such large spaces, such institutionalized spaces, or, or do we need to go to take a more alternative route? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's a too big of a question, but thinking specifically about do we abandon museums or are these networks of artists? How might we? Yeah, no, right? How, how, how might we create change? Because I think it's time. It's time to demand or, or either to demand our own space or I don't know make our spaces more, I don't know, blow them up. I don't know, maybe I'm being too radical right now. No, 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 not at all. I'm totally, I totally agree. We have to follow both paths, I think. I feel that, for instance, as like you're saying, the museum museums right now, it's very fashionable to talk about uh, decolonize the museum, decolonize this, decolonize everything, right? We're not gonna decolonize the museum because as you said, very rightly, the museum is a colonial institution. They were created in, in order to cement colonial thinking and to extend it, just like the academy was created, like universities were created for the same thing. The, the museum is never going to be decolonized. So what we need to do um, to, to, to cite uh, some of the thinkers from New Zealand, we need to make museums less toxic, less harmful to people like ourselves. So what can be done? What can be done in that respect? Uh, exist outside the museum or exist inside the museum and fight. I think we need to do both things. So an example for me that's very, very, very um, uh, relevant here in Canada is uh, Indigenous Curatorial Collective. It's in, in Spanish, the Indigenous Curatorial Collective. They work outside museums precisely for that reason. Um, they emphasize the idea that we're, if we work, were to work only in, inside larger institutions, we would always work under the white gaze, under the colonial gaze, the colonial gaze and the white gaze. So we would need to make, uh, we would need to compromise our vision to be able to work within those processes. And I know why they're saying that because I had to work in those institutions. We always have to shift. We always have to find a way where we, we, we need to be a little bit subversive to get the work in that we wanna get in and try to outsmart those institutions. The other, the other way to work from inside, how we do that. If you're working inside, you really got to fight. And I think that we experienced that in the United States and in Canada and in other parts of the world as well, uh, starting last summer, when we started to see that thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement, there was really, uh, repercussions, there began to be serious repercussions across different sectors, particularly in museums. So we could see how museums began to ask questions. And I think that mobilization, that activism is something that I do hope, it's still very, uh, I'm very skeptical still um, of what might happen. But for example, what we did last year, precisely in Canada, uh, because in the, the Human Rights Museum, the Human Rights Museum that I worked there for a decade of practically, the museum was racist, it was sexist, it was homophobic. They censored one of my exhibitions, they cut content, millions of things happened there, right? So 10 years of all that. And what we did last year, uh, this in summer of last year, people were, had it up to here. I was in uh, uh, Sweden again, I came home because of the pandemic and we started to see um, museum staff who are currently museum staff and other staff who, ha uh, who are Afro Canadian, Afro Canadian or uh, of African descent in Canada. They started to talk about what they had experienced. I had spoken publicly about what I experienced in the museum 
during the 10 years that I worked there. And there was a lot of repression and a lot of consequences for that, a lot of uh, retaliation. So I was just talking at the same time um, about these folks. So my, my friend Tiana Duob, who's Afro-Canadian, who started a movement that she called hashtag CMHR, which are the um, initials of the museum, CMHR Stop Like. And that was the campaign so that all of us who had been employees, who had been staff of the museum start to tell stories about that museum. So she called me and she said, let's join forces because you're doing your thing, I'm doing this thing. Let's join forces and let's go up, up against the museum. So we did it. And we, together with another friend whose name is Julie White, who was one of the indigenous uh, interpreters at the museum, we took possession of the uh, social um, the social account media accounts we started uh, of the uh, that movement and we started to get dozens and dozens and dozens of messages from the museum we made it public and it came out the and the CEO and president of the museum had to quit and they did a whole investigation also it was a whole process so there have been changes and we were the first to start in Canada but para a parallel process happened a lot of this was happening in the United States as well in parallel so we, started, I think it was June 7th when we started to put up our first messages um, in relationship to this campaign. But later, obviously Canada is a lot smaller than the United States, but we were able to have, I think up to now it's been about 20 museums, the largest museums where the employees have, have Four of the largest museums have uh, the Canadian History Museum, the Fine Arts Museum of Montreal, uh, the Royal Museum of in, in British Columbia. All of those leaders, all of those directors, had to quit, so or had had to resign. So there's ha, there's been all kinds of conversation about how racism functions in those in those institutions. And so I think precisely what I what I, I think I'm a little bit incredulous. Oh God, that word. I'm a little bit. I'm saying okay, yes, but. What is the support? What are the structural changes that are going to happen in those institutions so that people who are um, going to be working there now are not going to end up exhausted? And what? Uh, who is going to do that work of transformation? Who, Whose shoulders are we standing on when we're making those changes? So there needs to be a change, a systematic change in an institution. There has to also be a recognition of the labor, the emotional labor that all of these people have been doing and all of the support, the networks that are needed, also the communities that need to be connected to those struggles. So more or less, that's what I feel. I think that not just in the museum, but everywhere, but I'm also a little bit radical in that sense. Yeah, I think that in your case, uh, the advantage is that since you came from a lot from in one way or another, you are aware and alert of how they are responding to actual structural changes in a way of exercising colonialism and racism in societies where those practices are inserted. And uh, I think that also you with intergalactics is they're a good example you're a good example of how we can uh build these spaces in a way that they're less toxic right to be able to enjoy enjoy the fact that you the team at intergalactics were so open to this idea of having a satellite and maybe it's a little bit because of the nostalgia or the emptiness that that we wanted to get together here and the pandemic hit and well that was interrupted but fortunately we have uh, these uh, channels that are fantastic and can reach a lot of people and truly i've really enjoyed this conversation and i've learned from your ideas and i have a lot of uh, respect for uh, both of you for uh, the work that you are doing from the institutions, I mean, Daniela from the US and Armando in Canada. And I mean, you from different parts of Central America, I think that's also very important. Uh, the, the voice, I mean, it's not easy to work with institutions, but you can also do things, right? such as little rebellious explosions 
uh, that uh, we know that people value. And I don't know if we have uh, somebody here in the audience. So you can open, uh, like turn your camera on or if you want to show us your face because we're talking here. We're... But if folks want to ask a question. <laughs> Maybe. Beatriz, querías hacer una pregunta. Beatriz, did you want to ask a question or a comment? Well, I wanted to say something. Thank you so much for this for this uh, beautiful talk. A lo mejor si nos muteamos todos si pueden poner. Maybe if we could all mute. It. It's a little, you're a little choppy. What I wanted to say is that I think that it's very important to mention that in the Central American community in Los Angeles, families are uh, being divided and, and we cannot ignore it because it's our uh, families and maybe we have not forgotten, maybe for people forgot when Trump left, but we haven't forgotten. And I think that really uh, nails, the, hits the nail in the head because when we're working in museums, people were, you know, listening to the news and they were like trying to build all these uh, like news and they were like not really realizing that, for example, when I was uh, looking, I, when I was seeing those news, I knew that my family members uh, were looking at that. And like, to me, it's just not only part of the news. So that is the the, the disconnect there. So like, like you said, uh, the government and the museum, and you know, they stop caring. It is the, the topic that's, you know, in vogue. But for us, this is our community. This is our people. Exactly. I think this uh, connects with uh, with Adan was saying with pink washing, you know, using such thing like using immigrants because it is a topic that's uh, trending, and then you forget it, and then you leave it behind. This is this extractivism, this extractivism practice that the museum. Yes, and I think that also recognizing the work, and I think something. Uh, about intergalactics when we started this uh, research it's recognizing that there's a lot of previous work and that is still being done about these uh, topics and these matters so the idea of us you know building and creating maps and inviting other people like adan to uh, visualize that uh, uh, collaborative uh, work of a uh, resistance that is historical So it is important to recognize uh, the uh, recognizing the work of uh, activists and artists in our intersections that it is also a very fabulous. Carla, I don't know if you open your camera because you wanted to say something, Carla Yiniga. Beatriz and Carla are artists that are exhibiting exhibiting at Intergalactic. So. Beatriz, yes, but not me. My sister, my sister is part of it. But it is this labor that is something that we've been working together, but it is a piece that she conceptualized. So I'm like a mediator there. But thank you so much because a lot of the times where I am writing a thesis about the border, but because I am from Tijuana and we have lived uh, all of these uh, waves of migration of interest in the border, but I've also very scarcely, very rarely, they've asked me like, oh, what's happening in the border between Mexico and Central America? And I always tell them, well, from what I've heard, it is way worse. The border of Mexico is way worse and going uh, passing through Mexico, it is the most uh, dangerous uh, 
a fragment to like uh, walk through. So uh, thank you for illuminating us. I mean, I am a Mexican, so we always have that position of that. We just blame uh, the U.S., but uh, Mexico is also a very much uh, guilty. So we should also recognize the pain uh, that Mexico inflicts on immigrants and that we are dealing with those issues, but also there are some people that are trying to help, but a lot of the, the and also as a third world country, there is a lot of uh, damage that we have inflicted and a lot, a lot of the time it's also our, our people. So we shouldn't say, oh, you know, the US and Canada or, oh, you know, they're colonizers. And so thank you so much, Alan and Armando for all. So I think that that really stuck with me with this, that it is, it's not just us being in this position of victimhood, but also uh, reminding us. So thank you so much for the uh, work that you have been doing. And thank you so much, Daniela for uh, having uh, them here and to think about that situation a little bit more deeply. Thank you. So the idea of Trump's uh, wall at the end of the day, it was very successful because it became uh, a, a wall of police and uh, immigrant in, in immigration. And people are saying, oh, well, the, the wall did not uh, did not get built and he wasn't successful with this project, but they uh, eventually realized that the uh, legal and police and military uh, borders are much more efficient in that uh, Mexico learned and they started to implement the same uh, uh, things in Mexico. Yes, because in places like Tijuana, there are uh, three uh, walls. I mean, the community where I grew up, there's three walls. There's not only just one, there's three. And obviously, like helicopters and cameras, and and uh, it, it comes from other kind of like surveillance. It is not just a one uh, a wall, but it is a wall with a, a, a mechanism of death. But also, Mexico asked for help to to build or to create that same kind of wall in the south, and like people is uh, becoming uh, more like the U.S., which is very sad. And also, I just wanted to say that we should not forget uh, about our borders. I think that we really focus on the U.S.-Mexico border, but we also forget the Central America-Mexico border, but we also forget the Canadian uh, U.S. border that also has a lot of immigrant uh, stories and a lot of our stories. Like I said, I went to the uh, border. I slept by the border to help her. She crossed by foot and there's people, there's immigrants that come in the middle of uh, winter and they lose limbs, they lose fingers because of frostbite. There's also histories that we have in the Canada-US border. And I think that all of the borders that have and hold our uh, blood and our histories and sweat and tears of having to really go through all these uh, journeys. Yes, in the Zapatistas uh, were saying that let's not uh, focus in the, the the northern border, but also the southern border and the different uh, global borders. And that's also very important. And uh, I don't know if there are any other questions. Alexia tiene una pregunta o es un dedo? Claro. Ver, <laughs> ah, no. Claudia, Claudia, si quieres hacer una pregunta. Yeah, Claudia, if you wanted to ask a direct question, I think that you are in the phone, but if you want to turn your mic on and ask a question. Hola, ¿me oyen? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Claudia. So again, we're I'm working, but I just wanted to congratulate you all uh, for this uh, conversation and uh, a little bit of 
uh, what uh, we were talking about uh, exhibitions and alter alternative spaces and something that we've been uh, meaning to do in Intergalactics is that, but also projects can be a thought as unfinished or not finished. And I think that it is another option of uh, opening up not only an exhibition that has an ending, but that keeps mutating, that changes, that evolves, and that travels different uh, spaces, right? And I think that is something else that we can uh, bring. Intergalactics has been very punctual in that uh, idea of not uh, putting an ending on something, right? To uh, having something uh, in perpetual metamorphosis or change. That is something that I was thinking about when you were talking and uh, will also how is that uh, we can stop uh dividing ourselves from uh, south south america or how to uh you know keep uh, extending the territory and the, the borders that uh, sometimes it is just it's hard you know argentina uh, chile all these uh, places that uh, have have their own uh, immigrant uh, problematics or problematics related to immigration. I don't know from your practice or how is that you've been able to do that. Thank you, Claudia. I think that your uh, intervention and your questions are very important. I am. I agree that uh, the exhibition uh, should not have an ending. It is an opportunity to establish relationships and also relationships with the community. And I mentioned it. I don't want to just, you know, get there and then like steal stories, build an exhibition, and then you disappear. And so at least I have relationships with communities that, you know, go back to 11 years, seven, eight years. Even right now, speaking to my communities, I'm gonna go uh, with, to Mexico this uh, next week. So it's just that to continue those uh, relationships uh, with uh, related to what you were talking about in South America. So I also have the privilege of being able to work in South America a lot, quite a lot in one of the countries and that does an incredible work in relationship to the museum, to museums and the, the community work is Colombia. And Colombia also um, has an immigration situation with Venezuela because our neighbors that also, I mean, in Colombia, Naloca, which is and I had the opportunity of, of working because uh, the terminal is next to the museum and the Museum Casa de la Memoria, they do an amazing uh, work not only with immigrants that come from Venezuela, but also with uh, internal displacement, because it is also a really big phenomenon that people in in countries in, our, in Latin America, we have that, and sometimes we don't talk about that. And we don't. And like we were saying, uh, Costa Rica, it has also like a lot of uh, migration in Nicaragua. And like we were saying, how to create these uh, networks to support uh, doing. So I've also been trying to do that. And I've done a lot of virtual events, bringing uh, museum professionals from um, every part of Latin America so we can talk about uh, precisely about these topics, right? And uh, with the pandemic, maybe uh, it's been, and so some things it, it has, uh, done positive things and uh, getting together in communication, right? Yes, thank you. Oh, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Armando. I don't know if anyone else has a question, a comment. If not, I think we're, we're good, Daniela, with time. Yes. I don't know if Juan, if there's any question on Facebook that anybody might have 
put on the Facebook chat if you want to pass that to me, if there is anything. Seems like. No, but we're doing good for time. I don't know if you want to give any last concluding remarks or I don't know. There are no comments on Facebook Live. Okay. Well, I just want to, sorry, I want to speak. <laughs> I just want to say within relationship to what Claudia and Claudia Petalina is also part, uh, an important part of Intergalactics. And um, it's not just me. There's a lot of people working here, Jocelyn. Um, but I did want to say that something important about the research for Intergalactics was there to recognize that from here, from Los Angeles, there's an invisibilization that Central American diasporic artists do are recognized because this is a very, this is a city with a very strong tendency, a very strong Latinx community that is represented primarily by Mexicans and from just from here, I've been living here for seven years, but my entire life, I've lived in Mexico and Central America is like bl very blurry. You might study Latin America. We might talk about the unity of Latin America, but I, we don't, I don't. I mean, I went to a university to study history and, and cultural studies and right, but Central America is, something just erased there. So I think that I always say, I came to discover Central America in Los Angeles through the community here, the art artist community who's taught me a tremendous amount and have given me an opportunity now uh, with this project to be able to go there as well. But it's also something really important. I think that Latin America and these concepts also sometimes they might, they might help us in, in certain respects and certain ideas. There is um, that erasure. So I think it's important to, to listen from that center. I think it's really important. Yeah. Yeah, we also hope that folks will, will accompany us at the, at the further chat uh, conversations. We're going to have Antonio Romero tomorrow. We're going to talk about how migration is present in Salvadoran artistic production and in symbolic production. Uh, we're talking a little bit beyond um, here. Uh, Mauricio Caristán is, is here um, as part of Intergalactics, um, and he'll be speaking as well. And um, he's here in the space with me quietly. But I'm hoping that you all will join us in, in the other um, conversations on laces. Uh, web page. We have the whole program, also the cult the Spanish Cultural Center in San Salvador. And we wanted to ask Armando if you might give us a few closing words. And just uh, first, I would like to um, really thank you for your kind and generous presence at this talk and a hug up to you up there in, in Canada, a hug to you in, in the United States and the other countries uh, that are watching and listening to us today. Thank you, Adan. And yes, also, I just wanted to respond first to what Daniela just said, just this idea of the invisibilization of the Central American community and Central American artists. I think that, yeah, just as you're saying in Los Angeles, um, because there's such a, a, a majority of, of Mexicans and in Miami, you see a majority of, of Cuban Americans, right? So there's always everywhere where there's, there's a large number of Central Americans, there's some larger power, there's some larger group, right? So I do feel that when we talk in art history, when we talk about Latin American art history, Central America is the, the part that it's always invisible. It, it's just, it's blurry. We don't talk about it. We never think about our, the artistic creation, the artistic development that Central America has enjoyed. Or if we talk about Central American art, we're gonna frame it in terms of violence, the violence that exists in that region. But there's so much more that artists from the region are producing. And sure, the violence is part of our history. It's part of who we are and it's important for us to talk about it, but we can look at many, many other facets of our experience. And I think that Kelsey Cornejo is doing really important work, um, 
really important work around um, putting a gaze on Central American artists. So I think, yeah, we need what we need is I want to return a little bit to what you were saying that curators who need who's working at museums and we need more Central American people to be working in museums and institutions in those spaces where visibility might be offered to Central American artists. So that I feel that is very clear because if there isn't change of who's working in the institutions, they're not going to be able to open their doors that easily for to the change that we need. And uh, once again, just to close, um, I wanted to thank you all so much for this space because I think they are super important, as we've said before. I also sometimes feel totally isolated here in Canada because really, Central American people are working, of Central Americans working in museums are working in art history. I'm the only one. So just, I've been trying to gather diasporic Salvadoran and Central American artists who are here in Canada to make an attempt to create, to, to gain power in numbers. And, and precisely in these spaces like this really help us to establish these relationships and create those connections. The more people we are, the better we're going to be able to visibilize who we are and also to share the diversity of our experiences as Central American people. We're not just, it's not just one kind of experience or one kind of immigration to the United States, one kind of migration. There's a, a whole range of, of who we are, how we think and how we live. So thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you so much, Armando, Adan, and um, please continue to get connected to the other uh, talks in uh, North uh, Nether Triangle, and we're also going to connect with the fire theory as well. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. You have a great afternoon.